Today on Locked On Canadians, we recap the Montreal Canadiens game against the Arizona Coyotes. We talk about the trade value of Arturi Lekkinen and Ben Sherratt. And then we have a couple of interesting questions posed by listeners and Twitter followers that we're going to get into. Uh, one of them involves Ryan Suzuki. Another one re- re- involves Cole Caulfield's ceiling. For Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, everyone, and welcome to episode 573 of Locked On Canadians, your first listen of the day. And today we've got a packed episode with some fun hypotheticals and it's trade season. So, you know, everything we say could be obsolete by tomorrow. But when you're listening to this, I at least hope that you get some enjoyment out of our discussion. My name is Laura Saba, also known as the Active Stick, and I am joined by Scott Matla of Habs Eyes on the Prize. Scott, we've got a lot to get through. What are your thoughts on this beautiful Tuesday night? Well, I, I look at this game and I go, it, it, it's fine. They lost. Cole Caulfield scored two goals in eight seconds. They held out Ben Sherratt, which we'll touch on in a little bit. It it was a tank game. Like they, they outplayed the Coyotes, but couldn't get a save. They were basically the Leafs in this game. And you know what? <laughs> It the, the difference is we're not trying to make the Stanley Cup final. We're trying to finish last in the NHL. So I'm not I'm not too fussed by the way this game went. Would I like to have won a game where they were clearly the better team? Yeah, but at the same time, Dallas is coming up. They've got Ottawa this weekend. There's a chance to bounce back in other games. I'm hoping that either Jake Allen is back soon or Samuel Montembeau doesn't repeat whatever the hell this game was. So... It, it is what it is. It's it's not the end of the world. It's it's frustrating, but there's enough good stuff happening that I'm not going to be bothered about a, a loss to the Coyotes on a Tuesday night in March at all. And we did call it. We did say playing Samuel Montembeau too much was not going to be good for him. They played him in a back-to-back, and then two days later, they played him again. Now, either Caden Primo has some injury that we don't know about, or they really, really don't trust him. Like, I do not understand what's going on over there. Uh, you know, Samuel Montabo allowed four goals in the first period. You cannot do that and expect to win, even if, if you look at the rest of the metrics, whether you're just looking at shots, whether you're looking at possession time, whatever you're looking at, the Canadians were, like, dramatically the better team. So, for me, like, goaltending really let them down. But, again, I'm not too fussed. You know, that third period or even the end of the second period, right, where Cole Caulfield scored two goals in eight seconds. We're going to talk a little bit more about him in our final segment. But even that, like, starting from then onwards, it was an exciting game. You could see the Canadians trying to score. You could see them trying to make things happen. And if you're a fan at the Bell Centre, like, you're probably screaming your – your, your lungs out because I, I just looked, it was so, it started out not an interesting game where it seemed like it was going to be one of those grinding games where we were going to have to endure just a whole bunch of goals against and the Canadians were going to like fall apart or fall back. But what they did was they responded really well. And that's something that we wanted to see. And so far under Martin St. Louis, they have been doing that when they're having either a bad game or a bad period, they are coming back. They are making adjustments. They are finding their game. In this game, like I said, the Canadians were dramatically the better team. They had like so many great chances. There were so many beautiful plays. Unfortunately, they couldn't get any of them in the net. But you could see the excitement even on their faces. It looked like they were enjoying themselves, trying to make things happen. They didn't look frustrated. They looked like they were having fun playing hockey, playing fart, playing fart, (laughs) (laughs) playing fast, playing smart. Uh, don't make fun of me. It is late. I've already done my skincare. I'm ready to go to bed. We're just recording this episode. So you have it in the morning. Um, 
but yeah, they were playing fast. They were playing smart. You know, it was exciting. It was it was basically most of the things you wanted to see, minus goaltending and a little bit of defensive lapses. Uh, I I I can't really I can't fault the Canadians too much. At first, I thought uh, I I will admit I came in late to the game, so I had to go back and watch the first period during the first intermission and 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 try and kind of like decipher what happened. Uh, it it didn't seem like the Canadians were playing badly, to be honest. I think they just they they had bad goaltending, and and at the same time. Uh, the Coyotes weren't really giving them too much in the crease, so I, I, I just I can't I can't I can't say too many negative things about the Habs in that game. Positive things I can say, I liked Brendan Gallagher in it. Uh, I liked I liked Nick Suzuki always. Uh, Cole Caulfield obviously two goals in eight seconds, which I thought must be a record, but apparently not. The Canadians have scored two goals in four seconds. I think this was in 1960 something. I believe I was listening to RDS while I was making my dinner, and uh, and I, I and I I, I I just I thought about it and I was like, wow, like it's really impressive. Two goals in eight seconds. You know, I thought if they left him out there, he could have gotten a hat trick if if they if, if they give him just another eight seconds, right? It's wild to me is that because I get an alert from one of the other writers when I need to start cutting a highlight to post to Twitter here and they pinged me for the first one. And as I was cutting that, I got another one. And I went, are, are you just bothering me to get the first one again? And then, nope. It, as I looked up, it went, oh, nope. Cole Caulfield is just scoring another goal again. He went far corner on both sides of the net inside eight seconds and made it look just stupidly easy. Like. I, I, I'm running out of adjectives to describe Cole Caulfield. And I was talking with someone in the DMs on Twitter. And my first thought is Dominique Ducharme should be thrown in jail for what he did to Cole <laughs> Caulfield this season. As We've Andrew been Bur pretty merciless with him. On this on As Andrew Berkshire yeah. pointed out, Caulfield scored more in eight seconds tonight than he did under Dominique Ducharme in 45 games. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. It, it's, it's incompetence on an unforeseen level that he managed to screw up Cole Caulfield. I, it, it blows my mind. I don't know how he did it, but watching Caulfield rebound like he has under Martin St. Louis and yeah, they're still losing games and maybe he's got some other things to iron out, but Holy crap is Cole Caulfield. So good at the sport of hockey. And some people are like, <laughs> I didn't like Nick Suzuki tonight. And those people are wrong. They uh, are wrong. He played so well. What are they talking about? I truly don't know what they're talking about. I it, it's just one of those things that it's like, oh, he didn't get this or get that. It's like I I thought. Oh, he Suzuki, made one mistake. Yeah, who didn't on the team tonight? Like <laughs> I looked at natural stat trick. He was up there in expected goals. He was up there in Corsi. He played a ton. The Canadians played a good game outside of you know the final third of the final third there. Their protection around the net and their goaltending was not up to snuff tonight. They otherwise mercilessly pummeled the Coyotes without Josh Anderson, without Ben Sherratt, without Christian Dvorak, without Jonathan Drouin, without et cetera, without, without, Ryan without, Paling. without Ryan Paling. They did it with one bona fide NHL center, maybe two, depending on your status of Jake Evans, and they played well. I, I can't ask much more in the thing where you lose one of your top six wingers before the game. You're missing most of your defense. You're still missing this. You're missing that. I I can't be mad about it. And like, yeah, Arizona scored six goals, but the Habs were the better team. To, it's like the Winnipeg game all over again. Couldn't get a save. The Habs were the better team. Roll on to the next game. Maybe they're going to lose to Dallas. Who knows? We'll see what we can find when that game comes around. So... And we're going to talk a little bit more about Cole Coffee later in the show. What we're going to talk about next in just one moment is trade value for Arturi Lekkonen and Ben Sherratt. And that's coming up in just one moment. But first, as always, we want to tell you about Built Bar, one of our favorite sponsors. Protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. We can't say it enough. We love them. We get so much energy from Built Bar. And they're so delicious. They truly do taste like a treat. And they're always coming up with new and fun interesting flavors even though they have 18 delicious flavors as their regular rotation they're always high in protein they're always low in sugar they always are made with real chocolate 
And honestly, they will fit into your day so easily. I use them as breakfast. Scott uses them for hiking. And you can use them for energy. You can use them just for a pick-me-up. You can use them after your workout. Take them with you. Portable, delicious. What more could you possibly want? And if you want to try these bars that we constantly talk about, go to built.com and enter promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That's built.com. And you can enter promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. All right, Scott. So we know that Ben Sherratt was held out tonight. He was held out of the game. Martin St. Louis said it was management's decision, which means that there are probably trade calls going on. A trade must be imminent. They might be fielding. Um, but Scott, you found some 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 sort of rumored uh I, I guess it's rumored is it rumored is it reported i don't know how to say it like what do we think kent hughes is asking for ben Sherrod? i saw that he was asking for a first rounder so there there are two things that came out uh today and that it's been reiterated that Eli and elliot friedman said that the canadians have a ton of interest in jack mcbain from the minnesota wild and the wild are asking for a second round pick and i look at mcbain and i look at what uh, the Ducks got for Josh Manson, and I go similar type players here. That I go Ben Sherratt is probably equivalent to what you would send there. He's probably not as good as Manson. Ben Sherratt's fancies and core season, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are not great. Which he played on the Habs this year. He's never been a fancy stat guy's dream. You're getting him for playoff pieces, and I and my first thought is, I'm wondering if there's a McBain Sherratt trade here because. It all depends on whether or not the Canadians can get him signed. And they clearly have interest in him. And I get it. Like he's a six foot four center. He's been playing really well at the University of Minnesota, which means they've seen him when they've gone to watch Jakob Dobish, who won a truckload of awards at Ohio State. Rhett Pitlick plays on the Minnesota team. Uh, at UMD, obviously, there's Blake Biondi. I don't know how much crossover there is from UMD to Minnesota. I'm not super well versed in college hockey, unfortunately. So they got to see something that they like there. And the other thing that came out, um, Pierre Lebrun mentioned, and Andrew Berkshire tweeted this out, is that Kent Hughes believes Arturi Lekkanen is integral, 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 whichever way you pronounce that, to this team's cultural fabric. And if teams want to acquire him at the trade deadline, it starts with a first-round pick. And that starts with. And teams that are going to be looking for him that are going into the playoffs – you're probably going to have to add to that because your first round pick is almost a second round pick. Uh, Kent Hughes knows what he has. He's seen how valuable Lekkanen is. And when he came in and when St. Louis came in, their plan was to see who wants to be here, who is part of the solution. And looking at how much Arturi Lekkanen has been thriving lately and how well he's played, it's very clear that they see that too. And I'm glad they're setting a high asking price because if you're going to let him go, Make it worth the, your while. Don't let them go just for whatever bid you get. So I'm very curious to see what the market for Arturi Lekkanen looks like now. And I'm very curious to see what Ben Sherratt's is because like we hypothesized on the last show with Josh Manson traded, Ben Sherratt's value went through the roof. And he's got nine points in his last 10 games. He's being held out. Teams are going to – the the asking price on that has probably gone up now. There's probably a bigger market for teams who missed out on Josh Manson as it seems. Right. Absolutely. And I think, I, you know, we talk so much about Ben Sherrod's going to be traded, Ben Sherrod's going to be traded. I wonder, at the end of the day, if it comes down to the wire, if you're going to get anything for him and it's not what you think you should get, you're still getting something for him as opposed to letting him walk away for free and, and free agency. So I would still trade him no matter what the return is. But right now, at this moment, I would create a bidding war. And, and, and I think the Canadians are smart to be doing that. You just You just let it happen until you see a good return or a return that you think he's worth uh, or a return that you think you can fleece from somebody. I, you know, it, it, it's really interesting because it doesn't matter how much you look at his underlying stats. There's still chatter about how teams are desperate to have him. And I will say that I like Ben Chirot as a player, like I don't like his play on the ice, but I like him, right? You know, like, I feel like 
he has been part of the Canadians. He did impress us. You know, when he when he was signed, we were not impressed. Neither of us were impressed with the signing. But over the course of the the, the bubble playoffs and, and and the playoff run from last year, he did endear himself to the Canadians fans. And I, and, and I really do think, like, I do wish him the best. I hope he has a good time on a contender. But I, I don't want the Canadians to lose him for nothing in free agency. I do want them to trade him. Whereas with Arturi Lekkinen, he does so many different things well and he fits into so many different slots on this team he it would be a huge loss for Tree Lekkinen because there's a pretty good chance if you lose him you're going to replace you're going to need three different guys to replace what he does right not obviously (laughs) uh, uh, not the whole time on the ice but there's certain aspects of his game that you don't generally find all of them rolled up into one player so that I think is the importance of Arturi Lekkinen. And I don't think that the Canadians are willing to let him go. I do think saying like it should start with a first round pick is a huge clue as to where they think that, um, that, that where they see themselves without Arturi Lekkinen. Now I truly don't think they want to trade him. And I truly don't think they will, unless some GM goes really nuts and provides a lot to the Canadians. I, I like, I, I see Ben Chirot being moved easily. I don't see Arturi Lekkinen being moved easily. And the funny part about that is people point out, they're like, oh, well, Jesse alone is there. And I'm like, here's the thing. I love him as a player. His defense, his defensive game is not where it needs to be to do what Arturi Lekkinen does. I think Yelonen is going to be a very fun piece in the mold of a Caulfield, a real high energy offensive type player. And he'll make some plays in the neutral zone, but in the defensive zone, he's not going to be someone you can rely on. Like Arturi Lekin is out there on the penalty kill, on the power play, at five on five, with the net empty, in key situations, because he's trustworthy. He's a mature, well-rounded player. And is he going to be a 25-goal guy in the NHL? Maybe, maybe not. I don't think so. Not anymore. I think he tops out 15, 20 goals. But if you're getting that and a guy who's playing on your first wave uh, penalty kill can take a regular offensive shift, can help kill off the end of the game when you need it. That's so valuable, and he's an RFA, so it's not like they can trade him, let him go to UFA, and then sign him again in the offseason, which if that was the case, I'd be all over that because I think that'd be the smartest thing to do. You trade him, and you get all those pieces for a rental, and then you slap a new contract in his lap there in the offseason. But I, I'm very curious what the market's going to look like on him because there's going to be a lot of smart teams who want an Arturi Lekkinen. He he played well in the playoffs as a bottom six guy there. He doesn't have to be a top six guy on a on a playoff bound team. And as for Sherratt, it's a, just a matter of when, not if. At this point, like we are past the if stage, and I know there are Habs fans because they are always popping up in my mentions that well, I wouldn't trade him right now. He's doing this. You do understand how a rebuild works, right? You have to part and with the pieces. fact that they're not making the playoffs. Yeah, I don't understand the urge for people to hold on to Ben Sherratt. Like, I get it. Like, he's been he's the big lumbering himbo defenseman, and he's been playing well for us recently. But to rebuild, you have to get assets, and to get assets, you have to trade pieces that you have right now. It sucked when they traded Tyler to Foley, which was a 50 50 thing, not something I would have done, but I get it. I wouldn't trade Arturi Lekin in, but if the package comes along that you're getting a first and good prospects, you got to do it. You have to do it. It's a hard time. And this is a business. It is not anything personal, like simple as that. It, and that's why fans don't run hockey teams to be quite honest. That's exactly so. it. <laughs> That's exactly it. I do want to plug my appearance on the Habs Edition podcast, though. Uh, it was a long conversation. Dylan Watt was kind enough to have have me on, and we talked about a lot of hypotheticals, including are the Canadians actually going to be uh, major players in free agency, and are they going to go for it instead of a rebuild? Like That was a really fun, interesting conversation. But here, what we are going to do in our next segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about trade value and a player that uh, one of our commenters actually suggested that Canadians might want to go after. And then we're going to talk about Cole Caulfield's ceiling in the NHL. And that's coming up in just one moment. All right, Scott. So even though you're not supposed to read the comments, I do every day. And I will say that we have received an interesting, intriguing comment that I wanted to discuss on the show as a topic. And that's what happens when you're not a jerk. When you pose a question, when you give us an idea, we will discuss it and we will not block you and make you go away. So 
this comes from commenter Barry, and uh, it was about going after Ryan Suzuki. What about going after Ryan Suzuki? Now, that's an intriguing prospect because he obviously, you know, there's a whole Nick Suzuki connection, but he could be really good in the NHL. I think it would be tough for them to be on the same team, having a sibling, having that relationship where Ryan wants to carve his own path. But at the end of the day, if you're the Canadians and you know how the Carolina Hurricanes operate, would you try and get Nick Suzuki and what would you send back? You mean Ryan Suzuki. We already have Nick Ryan Suzuki. Suzuki. It I is know. Late. Oh my I God. Will, I almost again, jinxed it. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> so I look at it this way and go, Ryan Suzuki is a 20 year old center playing in the AHL with their, uh, I believe it's Chicago now uh, is their AHL affiliate. And he is, yes, he isn't lighting the world on fire, but he has a lot of talent in, he only has eight points in 19 games this year, which tells me he's probably been injured a fair amount too. Um, he had 10 points in 26 games in his rookie season. And then in his last year in the OHL, let's see, 23 plus 35 is 58 in uh, 44 games. Like he's he's got talent and he isn't quite, I think, Nick Suzuki. Like Nick Suzuki is, I don't want to say a generational talent, but he is an extremely talented player. And I think Ryan is just that step below there. And I look at Carolina and their defense right now is they've got Tony D'Angelo, who is injured. Uh, they have Jacob Slavin, who is phenomenal. Brady Shea, Brett Pesci, who is extremely underrated. Ian Cole, who's that really reliable guy. Uh, Ethan Bear, who they got from Edmonton. And then Brendan Smith, who is on an $800,000 deal. And here's the thing. I don't think they're going to be in for Ben Chirot because I think Eric Tulski is too smart for that. But I can see them being in for a Brett Kulak or, quite frankly, an Arturi Lekkinen because those are the kind of players I think that fit uh, the vibe of the Carolina Hurricanes there. But to get a guy like Ryan Suzuki, who is pro arguably probably one of their top-end prospects not playing in the NHL right now, I don't think just a Brett Kulak is going to get it done and I wonder how much does Kent Hughes want to give up to get pieces back like that? I think he wants to collect more than he's sending out. And yeah. the Canadians do have second round picks. They have this and that. So I'm wondering if they trade Ben Sherratt and then if they take one of the picks from that, if they get picks in that and then flip that in another deal. And I would love Ryan Suzuki in the Canadians organization because I think having Suzuki, Suzuki, Dvorak, Paling Evans, whatever, would be a really <laughs> fun, would, yeah, would be a really fun lineup. And I think JF Hool would welcome uh, another young, talented player like Ryan Suzuki. They need it in Laval right now because they're they're real light on guys, and I think he'd be a really fun add. But I just think the asking price on that is going to be too high. And this is entirely just uh, conjecture on my part. I'm wondering how many hurt feelings there start still are on the Carolina side of things from. Mark Bergevan being Mark Bergevan and uh, the owner of the Carolina Hurricanes being the owner of the Carolina Hurricanes. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's still some contention there, whether rightly or wrongly overall, but Brian Suzuki would be really, really freaking fun. Like we've talked about prospects from the Leafs in a Ben Chirot trade. Uh, I would adore getting a player like Ryan Suzuki in Montreal at this trade deadline. On it. It'd be like getting another first round pick. Right. Or even in the offseason. The, the thing that I think about Ryan Suzuki is whether or not he turns out to be as good as Nick or not, he does have the similar kind of talent in terms of his hockey intelligence and the way that he thinks. And that is a Martin St. Louis type player, right? Like that's the kind of player that he likes. That's the kind of player that he uh, is showing himself to be really good with. And that's the kind of player I feel like the Canadians want on the team as a whole. Like, as, like they would love a team of like all kinds of Suzuki's at different positions. Right. So I do think that it's a really intriguing idea, but like you said, I think it's really hard with, with, with somebody like Eric Tulski uh, evaluating talent like that, I don't think that it's going to be all that easy to pry Nick Suzuki from Carolina. But I Ryan, did appreciate Ryan. 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 Oh my God! I don't know why I keep doing it. I know it's because I'm tired and sleepy and I want to go to bed. But oh my God! I feel like I jinxed it now and have nightmares of being the reason that Nick Suzuki is no longer in Montreal. Like, don't I, you I, I don't put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. Do not put that evil on me. I do not oh want to wake God, up in a world is... where Nick Suzuki is not a Montreal Canadian. 
It no, is thank so you. late. It is, it is just, it's just, I'm sorry. I, I keep doing that. But no, it is an intriguing prospect for the Canadians to try and get <laughs> Ryan Suzuki, the other Suzuki. I think it would be really fun uh, in Montreal. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about, no, I do want to thank Barry for, for, for that comment and for the idea. Um, and like I said, like if you're, if you're cool in the comments, if you come up with things you want us to talk about, we'll definitely uh, incorporate them in the show. And, and again, like this, this, he didn't ask for us to talk about it, but we thought, oh, that's an intriguing idea. Let's discuss. Uh, and so another one came from uh, a friend of mine on Twitter who covers basketball. So I'm uh, not super into the hockey scene or, or the NHL scene and asked, what do you think Cole Caulfield's ceiling could be in the NHL uh, in terms of rankings? So I had this conversation actually with, with Dylan Wall on that, on the Habstetician podcast. The episode is out now. Um, and uh I don't know if it made it into the episode or not, to be honest. Um, but we did talk about, you know, like, are you looking at when you're looking at Cole Caulfield in his prime, could he possibly be one of the top 64 wingers in the NHL? I, I, it's I, hard because there's a lot of good wingers in the NHL. There's so many talented players in the NHL and there's so many coming up on the wing alone and I look at this and I go, I think he has potential to be a superstar, but there are so many good people and so many young, good players here that it's so hard to know where it's going to go. Cause like you have a guy like Maytav Michkov coming in the next draft and Connor Bedard and a Shane Wright and all these guys who could just be that next star. Like remember like Sasha Barkov was not a star originally when he was drafted. And then a couple of years later, boom, he's amazing. Jonathan Huberdeau was drafted, had a couple of you know slower years, then boom, superstar. Sebastian Ajo, kind of quiet, boom, superstar. We looked at you know Alex Gauchenyuk originally, and it looked like he was on his way there, and then just fell off a cliff. And it's so hard to know. Cole Caulfield has the shooting talent to be one of the 10 best wingers in the NHL, I think, at a given time. But I do not know overall – if the rest of his game is where it needs to be to be that, I think he's going to be an incredible talent. I think he's going to be a 30 goal guy in the NHL with pretty stunning regularity. And I think, and this is going to be a comparison I think is going to make a lot of people real, real mad. If Cole Caulfield can become what Phil Kessel was when he was in Boston and Toronto, the Canadians are doing real well for themselves because Phil Kessel was a slam dunk for 30 points or 30 goals, 60 points a season even on bad teams. And if that's what you're getting out of Cole Caulfield, a lethal threat on the power play who can, you know, take that puck and make defenders look silly, you are crushing it. Where do people consider Phil Kessel as an all-time winger in his prime? Uh, depends on who you ask. Uh, if you ask Steve Simmons, uh, ne nowhere near the top. But if you ask actual smart people, it might be different. So <laughs> it's so hard to know because this season has been crap and great at the same time. And he probably falls somewhere closer to the better end of things, but there's a lot of career left to go. So it's, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I think so for me, the thing with, with Cole Caulfield is it's exactly what you said. And you think about Phil Kessel, right? Like he was 30 goals on a bad team and then you put him on a good team and he was a playoff MVP, right. Or almost MVP. I can't remember if he won the con Smythe or he was just in the conversation for it, but you know, and so like what you're like the ideal case for Cole Caulfield is he's a 30 goal scorer on a bad team, the Canadians, and then you put him on a good team, still the Canadians, right? So that's 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 what you're hoping for from Cole Caulfield. But I thought it was a really interesting question because it came up yesterday and then it came up in my Twitter mentions today. So I thought, hey, let's discuss it on the show, right? Um, and uh, I do think that it's possible that because you're looking at it and you're like, all right, why why did we say top 64? There are 32 teams in the NHL and each top line has two wingers, right? So can he, like, would the Canadians top line be able to compete with other top lines in the NHL? When Cole Caulfield and Nick Suzuki are in their prime, depending who's on their other wing, it's possible. I think it's a little bit early to tell, but it's totally possible. You know, it, the only thing with Cole Caulfield is that today's NHL, like the better players are the ones that are a bit more well-rounded than he is. So it's not to say that he can't get there. It's just to say that, what you're counting on him to do isn't necessarily those other things that most of those other wingers that are in the conversation do. Now, I think that it's an intriguing thing to follow for the rest, you know, for the rest of his Canadians career. And hopefully it's, it's with the Canadians and, and successful for a very, very long time. In the meantime, 
Uh, we will obviously be talking about Cole Caulfield almost all day, every day. Same thing with Nick Suzuki. <laughs> um, we do, we do, we do love uh, the Canadians are having fun, playing well. They're being exciting, and we're going to continue to cover it. And we've got lots of fun stuff coming up. So make sure you're subscribed to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, and uh, make sure you follow my co-host. Scott Matla on Twitter at Scott Matla. You can follow me at the Active Stick. You'll find the show at L O underscore Canadians. For those of you who want to send us emails, you can send them to us at lockdowncanadians at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. And if you liked this podcast, make sure you check out Locked On Fantasy Hockey.